Welcome to Ocean County Baptist Church. We are so thankful that you are back with us this evening to worship the Lord. Those of you that are on live stream, welcome. We are glad that you are with us. Let's stand. Let's open our service tonight by saying the hymn number 190. It came upon a midnight clear. It came upon a midnight clear. That glorious song.
Send it, Jesus. Lord, thank you that we can have full assurance because you've told us, Lord, that when we place our faith and trust in you, we are sealed. And Lord, what a day that will be, Lord, when we see you face to face. And Lord, we're excited, we're hopeful. And Lord, our, our hearts are just stirred, Lord, with just the wonder of all that took place in that manger. And Lord, we do pray now that you would bless this preaching of your word tonight, Lord. Bless the service. Open our hearts. Open our minds. Lord, draw us closer to you through the preaching and teaching of the word of God tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore no, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen. Amen. chapter 9 and verse 57, I want to share a message entitled, Don't Look Back. And uh, I don't think anybody's going to want to look back at 2020, but <laughs> don't look back. In uh, Luke chapter 9 and verse 57, 
says, And it came to pass that as they went on the way, certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where uh, to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. And he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my home, at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Father, we come to you. We thank you, Lord, for grace. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we uh, can enjoy each day of our life. And uh, God, we're just thankful for uh, this time that we can gather together and sing songs to be able to study the word. I pray that you would encourage and strengthen us tonight. Uh, give us a resolve in our hearts, Lord, to always be looking to, towards the future. Uh, be, may we be able to have a vision of what God can and will do in our life, uh, uh, not just today, but tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. Uh, and uh, I just pray that you would use us in a powerful way. We would not allow uh, things of the past to di disrupt our ability to move ahead uh, with a positive spirit, a positive attitude, and uh, with a vision of great victory uh, in this new year. And so I pray that if there's anyone listening by live stream or anyone here in the building that have never been saved, I pray they would come to know Christ as our Savior tonight. But I also pray, Lord, for us believers, uh, that you just encourage us and strengthen us, challenge us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text verse is verse 62. Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Uh, I read a quote that said, Don't look back, something might be gaining on you. And, uh, you know, when someone is in a race, uh, they're not always looking to see who's behind them. They're always looking towards the goal. Yeah. And uh, the Apostle Paul said, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. His focus was the future. It was focus was where he was going. And I think sometimes what we do in our Christian life is we allow ourselves to be distracted by where we are right now and where we're going because of what happened yesterday. And the reality is you can't change anything that happened yesterday. And uh, you can't make it, the outcome different. Uh, and you can't, and you shouldn't allow it to rob you of the joy of moving forward in Christ Jesus. The Bible always presents the Christian life as a race. Whether it's the Apostle Paul speaking about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, or whether it's uh, Paul speaking about Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2, that we're all in a race, let us lay aside the weight that uh, so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. And uh, But our life as a Christian is in the fast lane, amen? <laughs> we're moving ahead. Time doesn't wait for anybody. Amen. And so we always need to be pressing ahead. In our discussion panel tonight, we were talking about the rich man who uh, thought he had plenty of time to build bigger barns and all that and uh, everything that was going on in his life, but his soul was required of him that night. And so we are in a race. We are moving ahead. We can't look to the past. We can't give up on our life and our testimony because of something that happened uh, before. If you're going to succeed in our endeavors in Christ, don't look back. Uh, there is plenty of failures on plenty of quitting places. I just think uh, when I was in Bible college, that was a long time ago now, but I was in Bible college, that's, uh, and I always wondered why did they hear so many messages on don't quit? And so many messages on this matter of just uh, enduring to the end and keeping it up and not giving up. And, and I often thought, my goodness gracious, there are that many people quitting and giving up in life and ministry. 
And uh, after 35 years of ministry, now I understand why I heard so many messages like that. Because there are many, many quitting places, whether you're in full-time vocational ministry, as they call it, or whether you're a layman working in the church, uh, you're a, uh, living your Christian life, there's plenty of places that the devil will come along and try to entice you to stop walking with God. It'll try to entice you to stop worshiping the Lord. And certainly when it comes into the area in the realm of ministry, he'll try to discourage you and dissuade you from that opportunity to serve Christ. Right now I'm, I'm praying about and I'm working on some material, uh, training material for the new year to be able to uh, direct people in our church to prepare to become teachers whether it be in children's church or whether it be in Sunday school, because we are going to be having Sunday school again. Amen. We are going to be uh, was, uh, having, continue to have gender church. Uh, how are we going to do soul wedding? What type of instruction are we going to be able to do that? And it, what is easy to do is to look back at 2020 and say, well, we didn't go soul wedding in 2020 because we had to wear a mask and everybody had to be quarantined and everybody had to have social distancing and everybody had to walk around with uh, sanitizing soap so they can wash their hands all day long. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we, we can't do things like that. Uh, no, you can't look to the past to give you a reason not to do something in the future. And I think if we're going to be able to succeed as a Christian, then we need to be prepared for what it is that God wants to do. Uh, uh, Ecclesiastes always challenges us to, do, have, to uh, have great thoughts in reference to this matter of, of evaluating our accomplishments, to determining what is our desires that we have before the Lord. And we are to live out our life for the glory of God, and serve him with the gifts and the talents that he has given us. However, if you press forward to uh, better, uh, to do better and greater uh, than you did in this year, you have to be careful that you're not going to be looking back to justify every wrong move or every mistake or whatever failure or shortcoming you may have. Because if you keep looking back, it will depress you and it will defeat you. And so you, you, you just got to get up and keep going. A righteous man will fall seven times, but will rise up again. And so we get up and get going. I have made plenty of mistakes in my life as an individual. I have made a multitude of mistakes in my life as a pastor. As a church ministry, we have never done everything completely right. And, uh, and may I say this, there's no church that has. And uh, so if you're thinking about going to another one, don't go because you'll mess that one up too. Amen? <laughs> so don't look back at what has happened in the past. And I, I know I've, I've gone out soul winning and I've talked to people over the years and people have said, well, you know, I know a Christian or I know a church that did such and such. And, and all right, so you're allowing something that you cannot control, you cannot change that happened in the past to hinder your opportunity right now to get right with God and to live for the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ. So don't look back. And uh, several things here I thought about. Well, one thing, let me just mention our text verse again. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. I want to put that picture up of that guy walking with a, Horses plowing. I praise God I've never had to plow with horses. Uh, but anyway, you don't see him looking back at what's going on in back of him. You see him focus on going forward. Uh, he cannot direct the horses that are pulling the plow if he's not watching where they are going. And listen, you, you cannot uh, direct your footsteps and your life for Jesus Christ if you're not paying attention in reference to where you're going. Uh, I, oftentimes I have counsel with people and I said, you have to understand the decisions you're making right now is putting your feet on a path that's gonna take you in a direction that you want you don't wanna go. And and what, they, what do they do? Rather than focusing on the long-term effects of their decisions in their life, they look back at what their life was before and decide 
to go back into that old lifestyle and that old way. And their, and their life from, listen, their life from that point on is never profitable for God. And I know because I've seen them. And I see what they do. I see what, what how they act. I see how they relate. I see what's on Facebook. You know, it's great, 2020, uh, 2021, whatever year we're going to be in, amen. It's great because of the fact that everybody, everybody posts everything that they're doing at every moment in every day. I mean, it used to be years ago and you say, you confront somebody and say, you know what, you know, I, you're, you've been doing this, that, you know, you're living wrong and all. Oh, no, I'm not. They lie all the way through, you know. Now, where's the proof? Show me the proof. Well, we don't need any proof. Now you post it all over the internet. I mean, people in China are looking at you and saying, what is wrong with those people over there? <laughs> but the problem is we want to be successful. At least I would think you want to be successful as a Christian. Uh, to some reasonable extent, I want to be su successful as a Christian. And I know this, that I cannot move ahead in my Christian life if I'm constantly going to be letting off go of the plow. I've often used the illustration when we would plow, uh, when you're going across the field, you keep looking forward straight ahead. Because as soon as you turn around to look at that plow or to look at what you're doing, when you turn back around, there's a crank in the furrow. You cannot turn around without creating a creek in your line or path of where you're going. And every time you learn around, turn around and look backwards, uh, you're causing yourself to go off track. And so don't look back. And you say, well, you know, just you, you, have, to, you have to understand these are things i got to take care of. Let it alone. Get it, get it right with God and move ahead. So don't look back. First of all, why? Well, what are some things we can do? Don't look back at sins that have been forgiven. Hey, hallelujah. Right, right. You know, if God has forgiven you your sins, then why do you keep looking back at them? And the longer you look at the sins that you have done in the past, uh, it will the devil will use that to entice you to get involved in, or involved in it again. And so don't look back at past sins uh, that God has forgiven you for. In Joshua chapter 1, in uh, verse 8, I'll turn it over real quick and read that for you. Joshua 1, 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written thereon in for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. He didn't say to look back at your past. He said, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. That's what's going to make the difference. And so everyone has sinned. We know that. Everyone has sinned. But God sent his son into this world to die for sinners to be able to deliver us from the bondage of our sin and to forgive us of all of our sins. And if he has forgiven us of all of our sins, then there is no need to look back at those sins that have been forgiven. So well, how do I deal with that? Determine to be pure. That's all you got to do. Determine to be pure. And uh, God has a way for us to live. Just decide that's how you're going to live. If you have problems with internet access to things that you should not be looking at, then determine you're going to put blockers on it. Determine, man, if you're having a problem with pornography, then give your wife access to your uh, uh, pages and your computer and everything else so they can check on you to make sure you're not having a problem there. Accountability. Determine to be pure. And uh, whatever passwords I have on email, whatever, my wife can access all that stuff. I don't have a problem with that. I can access her stuff. No, we don't have a problem with that. Why? Because there's nothing to hide. Amen. And why? Because God has forgiven us of all of our sin. And if he has forgiven us of our sin, our determination is not looking back at what we used to be, but looking forward to what God wants us to be by determining we're going to live a pure life. And, uh, I, you know, I often said in the last several weeks, I've been kind of 
reminiscing in my mind of what my life was without Christ. And I'll tell you, I was a wicked person. I had to stop thinking about it. And not that I was being enticed to go back and be a part of that. But I'll tell you one thing, the devil was going to use that to be a source and a means of discouraging and defeating me because of what I was without Christ. Well, wait a minute. That's not who I am. Amen. Who I am is a person who is forgiven of all of my sin and set free from all that sin. And my determination is I'm not going to go back and defile myself with that sin again. So don't look back. Well, you know, I just, you know, I have to look back at my, no, you don't. You don't have to look back at your life. Look at what your life is right now in Christ. You want to look back at something, look at the ways God has blessed you. God, the way God has delivered you. Testify of the grace of God that's worked in your life. Determine to be pure. Don't look back at sins that have been forgiven. Uh, confession brings that cleansing. If you have looked back and you have looked at those sins and you've been enticed to go back to those sins, I remember uh, years ago when, uh, what was that thing, Messenger or something came out, I forget, some chat thing came out. But anyway, when that all came out, people all of a sudden were connecting with people from their high school years. I don't remember people's names when I went to high school. <laughs> I don't remember, I don't know where they're at. I don't know how they live. I couldn't find them if I had to find them. And, and they were, all of a sudden, there was marriage trouble. People reconnecting with a girl or a guy that they were interested in when they were in high school. You do realize that after 50 years of being out of high school, you are looking pretty old. <laughs> I look in the mirror and there's my perception of how I look. <laughs> then there's the reality of how I look. <laughs> so we have to be careful that we're not looking back with a false assumption that our life would be better based on those relationships and experiences that were nothing more than sin. Amen. Amen. We need to confess our sins. Why? Because confession develops commitment that enables sanctification. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So why would I want to look it back at something that was filthy? Why would I want to look back at something that defied me, filed me and defeated me? And so don't look back. Also, don't look back at sins that have been forgiven. Why? Because God not only has forgiven all of us sinners and cleansed all of our sinners, us sinners, but God removes that sin from us. I am thankful. Listen, when I got saved, I was an alcoholic. When I got saved, God removed that taste in my mouth. Amen. God removed that desire. He didn't just forgive me of that sin. He removed it out of my life. And so why would I want to embrace that? To look back would mean that sin has taken dominion when in reality sin has no dominion over us. If God has taken our sins and so far as he removed it from the east and the west, if he has cast them into the deepest sea, if that sin has been removed in your life, then how can it have dominion over, over you anymore? I used to smoke three packs of cigarettes a day, and uh, I'm going to tell you, those rotten things had dominion over me, because, you know, I'd drink a cup of coffee, I'd have to have a cigarette. i pull in with a load to get ready to back up into the dock, you have to light up a cigarette. After you drop the trailer and hook onto another trailer, you got to light up a cigarette. I mean, you talk about dominion over you. You talk about something controlling you. People talk about, well, I don't want people telling me what to do. I don't want God... Got oppressing me about how I should live. Well, you let all your vices in life control you and dominate you. Right. So why would I want to look back at something that used to dominate me that God has removed it and no longer dominates my life? And so if I want to be successful and I want to move ahead, I don't look back. Don't look at the sins that have been forgiven. Number two, don't look back at defeats 
that get you down. And uh, I'll tell you, you talk about having a pity party, I can have a good pity party. And uh, I don't invite anybody to them. I like doing them by myself. And, uh, and I can look back and look at the feats that'll get me down. I think back in the past and say, oh man, I did this, and man, I didn't handle that situation right, and boy, I just, man, I'll tell you, I can't, I'm a, I'm a rotten preacher. I'm no good. Uh, and what, what am I doing? The devil is, is guiding me and directing me to look back at my failures and those defeats in my life, and every time you look at those defeats in your life, you think less of yourself than the value that God has placed on you and who you are in your relationship with Christ. And so acknowledge God's leadership in your life. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And so acknowledge God's leadership in your life. And uh, I, listen, I pastored three churches. In all three churches, I had preachers tell me not to pastor those churches. I went out to start a church when we came back to New Jersey in 1984 to start a church in Oakhurst. I had people tell me, boy, you don't want to go back east. You need to go over here. You know you go there. You need to do this, that, or the other. Uh, people were against the fact that I was going to come and start a church in New Jersey. I took a small church in South Jersey. Dividing Creek Baptist Church. It used to be an American Baptist Church. 16 years before I went there, they became an independent Baptist Church. And uh, I, had, I had preachers calling me and telling me, you don't want to take that church. I'm telling you right now, that's a board-run church, and it's this, and it's that. And, that, and that's going to ruin your life, your testimony, and your ministry. You don't want to take that church. And then God directed me to come up here and candidate, and I'm going to tell you, when I came up here to candidate, I had preachers calling me and telling me, oh, you don't want to go to that church. You wouldn't touch, you shouldn't touch that church with a 10-foot pole. They'll ruin your reputation, brother. Now, what am I saying? I had a choice to make in all three situations. Am I going to look at disappointments and failures in the past and disappointments and failures in other people's lives to direct my decision? Or am I going to acknowledge the leading of God in my life? Amen. And we must learn how to acknowledge God's leadership so that we will not fall in the trap of constantly looking back at failures and defeats that we have to go through. Because the reality is you're going to fail at something this year. You're going to fail in some situation or relationship this year. You have failed in something this past year. So what's going to determine your outcome? What's going to direct your life? Let the Lord be Amen. the leader in your life. And so we need to acknowledge God's leadership. Uh, we need to act upon God's strength in your life. And uh, it's not a matter of us living in our own strength, but rather living in the strength that God can give us and only God alone. It is only God will get you out of bed every day. It is only God that's going to enable you to face the trials and difficulties of this new year. And if you're not going to walk in the strength of the Lord... Uh, then realize this, that you are going to be always looking for another way out. You're going to be always looking for another means by which you can try to accomplish what it is you're striving for, only to become a failure because of the fact you need the strength of God. In Psalm 37, in verse 24, tells us this, And uh, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hands. And realize that tonight. You don't need to look back at defeats and be constantly discouraged and beat up by defeats in your past. Because it is God's strength who holds us up. He is the one that enables us to go on. And I can tell you this. There has been many a place in my Christian life where I did not think I would have the strength to get out of bed the next day. Where I did not think I would have the strength to stand up in this pulpit and preach. 
But as I turned and acknowledged the leadership of God in my life and realized that God can give me the strength and the help that I need, I can get up here and preach. I'm going to tell you the other day, it was last week, I felt I, I just I just felt I couldn't get up and preach. I was battling. And I, I prayed. I'll tell you, I, I got I got here not this past Sunday, the Sunday before. I got here at 3 30 in the morning on Sunday morning. And I come walking across that parking lot. I was praying, I was crying out to God. I said, God, I need your strength today. Because I can't do this. I can't do it. God, you've got to give me the strength to be able to go on it. And I'll tell you, I came in here and God gave me an power and strength and ability to stand in the pulpit and preach without intimidation, without a, a sense of being a failure, but as a, a sense that God was with me and God was helping me. And so don't look back at defeats in 2020. Don't look back at the defeats in your life. Look to the future to a God who is strong enough to get you through. The Bible still says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Amen. And so act upon God's strength. Then I see this a matter of acquired confidence through life experiences. In other words, God will take you, take you and put you on a path in life that will enable you to experience his power and his move in your life. And uh, if, if there's no other reason for you to live for God, it certainly is so that you can have life experience so you know that God is the one who is moving and directing in your life. I'm, I'm thankful at the time of tragedy and the time of difficulties, now, we don't rejoice in those things, but those things I rejoice in after they're gone. Amen. Yep. Because of the fact that is a life experience that God has given me to show me who he is. Mm -hmm. And he is still on the throne. Amen. He's still in control of all things. He has not forgotten about the world that he created just because there's COVID-19 in it. Amen. Amen. He, listen, I was, I was listening to a, a news clip and they're saying about all this cyber attacks that's going on on the United States right now. Yeah. That, that is unbelievable yeah. how deep the attacks are and how our national security is so jeopardized right now. And I thought to myself, well, I don't need to know that because God's still on the throne and he's still in control. And God knows what he's going to do. And I don't know how America will fail. I don't know how politicians are going to fail. I don't know how I'm going to fail. I don't know what things in the past that has brought this on. But I know this. I need to have a confidence that God is still in control. And he's going to keep me going Amen. through this new year. Amen. Amen. So I'm not going to look back. Don't look back. At defeats that get you down. We developed this woe is me attitude. You know, Elijah did that. He was oh, uh, at the brook Cherith and he was crying out to God, Oh God, I, only I, am left. Uh, that stand for you. I stand all by myself. We get this me mentality that we think we're the only ones doing anything for God. And God reminds Elijah, wait a minute, I have 7,000 other saints that have not bent the knee to Baal. And bless God, the world may literally be going to hell in a handbasket. And it may be falling apart. And it may be corrupted. But I'm going to tell you one thing right now. There are still other believers in Christ Amen. in this world that's praying and believing God. Amen. So I don't need to whine and complain about things. Although I enjoy doing that. <laughs> but I need to get over myself. Amen. Don't look back at defeats that get you down. Because when it gets you down, there's a crook in that fur. There's a crook in that path that God has you going on. Well, don't look back and see the past better than it was. It's not better than what it was. You know, uh, Jimmy Fowler's dad was over here with his uh, his uh, new Kenworth that he bought, and uh, he was like, "Pastor, you got to drive that thing." I said, "Oh yeah." I said, "I can go out there and drive that baby." 
And I thought, man, I'll tell you what, sometimes I think I'm going to just get in a truck and drive to California and back. Just take me a trip. And I got in that truck, a 13-speed Road Ranger. Oh, man, I was driving that big. It was all right. And as I was climbing up in the truck, the last step, I had to really stretch to get that last step. And I was like, man, what is wrong with this picture? I, I act like I had it together. I got in there and I told him, I said, it was okay, we look at the pattern here for shifting. I said, let's go. And I was, all I had was the tractor. And I'm turning, I'm going through the parking lot. And I thought, this thing is huge. <laughs> I've never thought that in my life. I said, this thing is huge. What in the world would this thing be if I put a 55-foot trailer on the back? 53-foot trailer on the back of it. And we took a ride, we went around the block or whatever, and came back, and it was fun driving it. And uh, I thought to myself, you often think that when you were driving truck that it was better. But God just showed you it ain't any better. So stay out of the driver's seat before you hurt yourself. Amen. Don't look and back and see the past better than what it was. Often think, Oh boy, I just missed those days on the farm. Oh yeah, getting up at five o'clock in the morning and milking cows that have been laying in the barn all night and their tails is all full of manure and everything else. And you try to go in there and kneel down next to them and cook them and uh, uh, milk them. And the next thing you know, they swat their tail around and smack you in the face with that sloppy old tail. I'll tell you, I missed the good old days. <laughs> The sad thing is we make decisions based on the good old days that weren't that good. That's right. That's right. Why, an inflated past will deceive you in the present. Don't inflate the past better than what it was because it will deceive you. And they were great days. I loved growing up on the farm. I loved everything about it. Driving the big equipment and doing everything. was. I loved being a farmer. I really did. But I'm going to tell you one thing. It's not better than preaching. Amen. I'd much rather get up in the morning and put on a coat and tie, a shirt and tie and a coat, and come to work and not have to worry about dealing with stupid cows <laughs> than I would have to go back to that type of lifestyle. It was great when I lived it, but I ain't going back to it. Yeah. An inflated past will deceive you. Watch out. Here's a good quote. D distant lens enchantment. The farther or the longer you're away from something in the past, it becomes brighter. And uh, I thought about when I was driving tractor and trailer. I often think about driving truck. And then I start, and I actually start thinking, oh, yeah, being out on the road. When I first started driving tractor and trailer, I was hauling flatbed, and I was a gypsy. That meant you just work for whatever company, you just get in a truck stop, call, and see if there's a load. You t and wherever it's going, you're going. And I would be gone for two weeks, two, three weeks sometimes, before I got home. Oh, I, boy, isn't that exciting. And then, uh, then I got a more local run, and that would be gone for three, four days. And I thought, man, this is living, man. I'm only gone for three, four days. You know, I can go to bed every night. It's great. I could sit down in my family room and fall asleep and take a nap to get ready for bed. Amen? <laughs> That's a whole lot better than driving all night long, running, driving about 100,000 miles every year, dealing with dispatchers, dealing with... DOT, dealing with the fact that the tires blow out and all that and the other, I'll tell you, I just I, it's a whole lot better doing this than what I was doing back then. Amen. Distance lends enchantment. I read this quote, nostalgia is never quite honest. <laughs> you know, I start thinking about the past and then I start telling myself how good it was and all that went play, took place. And then I stop, it's like the Lord smacks me and says, that's not what happened. <laughs> then I really start thinking about what happened, and I was like, yeah, you're right. That didn't happen that way. We like to add to it. We like to embellish. We don't want to be completely honest with what the past was. People say, well, I had a better life when I wasn't saved. No, you didn't. No, you didn't at all. You know you didn't. 
Vance Hagner said this, the present is never as good as it used to be. People say, well, you know, that's not the way it used to be. I, I don't know what I think. I start to tickle myself. I get happy up here. I get preaching. I start saying, oh, man, this is not like it was in the good old days. And I think, you stupid idiot, stop saying that. There's a whole lot of things that are better in 2020 than was around in 1965. Yeah. So don't look back and see the past better than what it was. An inflated past will deceive you in the present. And an um, uh, imitated past, well, there's going to be more I'm trying to say. An imitated past will defeat you. In Numbers, we don't have time to look over in Numbers chapter 11 and verse 4 through 6 and verse 18 through 20, we read of the children of Israel reminiscing about what they were able to eat in Egypt. God was feeding them with manna from heaven. They loathed the manna from heaven. Why? Because they remembered eating the onions and the leeks. <laughs> in Egypt. And I thought, I'd much rather eat manna any day than some rotten old onion and a leek. <laughs> what was the problem? They were trying to imitate the past and it became a defeat for them because God said, you want to eat meat? I'll give you meat. I'll give you so much meat that it'll rot and it'll be loathsome in your nostrils. And God rained down quail upon them why? Because they were looking back and seeing the past better than what it was. They were slaves in Egypt. They had no freedoms. They had no liberties. And yet God was miraculously feeding them, leading and directing them while they were wandering through the wilderness. Well, here's another one. No more. I only got 22 more. No, that's not true. Don't look back at old conflicts that make you bitter. Ooh, that's a good one. Why? You will hinder the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Uh, well, Paul tells us that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 and 31, that we're supposed to be kind one towards another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And he tells us to do that because, he says, we're either let all bitterness be removed from us. And so the Spirit of God cannot work in us if there is bitterness in our hearts. Why? We grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And so he says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. And here it is. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Don't look back at old conflicts that make you bitter. Don't look back at things, my wife and I always joke around, trigger. <laughs> Some psychologists will say there's certain things people say, and it's a trigger. And it takes them back to when they were wrong and what they experienced. And it causes them to have bitterness towards that person. Don't let the trigger pull on you, man. I'm telling you right now, don't look back at the conflicts that cause you bitter, your bitterness. I'm telling you, every one of us in this room has something that has happened to us in the past that if you hear about it, the hair on the back of your head starts, back of your neck starts going up. When you hear about it right away, you, you start getting tense. You start thinking, well, yeah, well, that person really did me wrong, I, I'll tell you. And bitterness overwhelms your heart, and you wonder why the Holy Spirit's not moving. Don't let things of the past create bitterness in the present that hinders the flow and the move of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Not only will you hinder the work of the Holy Spirit, but you will infect wounds that will destroy you. If you allow the conflicts of the past to create bitterness in your heart, it's like taking an open wound and rubbing salt in it. Don't, listen, don't let the wounds become infected 
by some conflict that happened in the past. Give it to Christ. Amen. You know, forgiveness, that's what forgiveness is. It's releasing the person from that wrong. God forgave us. When he forgave us, he released us of the wrong that we had committed against him. And to release somebody from that wrong means you don't hold it against them. You may, listen, you may have to deal with issues and, uh, and, and also establish ways to be able to protect yourself and all these different things. But I'm going to tell you right now, the bitterness of the past does not have to become the infection in your wound in the present. And you're the one that can decide whether you're going to uh, apply the salve of the Holy Spirit in your wound or whether you're going to allow the infection of bitterness to well up in that wound to the point where it destroys you. Don't look back at those things. You will hinder, if you allow the conflicts of the past to make you bitter, you will hinder true worship that is needed in you. Jesus said if you come to the altar... You remember you have aught with the, your brother. Leave your gift at the altar. Go and make things right with your brother. And so, the, why? Because they were coming to the altar for a purpose of worship. But their worship was being hindered because of the conflict that he had uh, with his brother. And so, you will hinder your true worship of God at, that you need. I need to be able to worship the Lord. I've had people say, well, I'm not coming back to that church because so-and-so did me wrong. And I'm telling you, when they come into the church, I just feel the hair on the back of my neck go up. And so I can't come to this church anymore. I've actually had people say that to me. And they've left the church. And I thought to myself, who has the real problem here? Yeah. Is, the per is it the person who actually did the wrong? Or is it you who is bitter and unwilling to forgive and release that person from that wrong? The greatest liberty that you'll experience in your life is to be able to look the person who has wronged you, bitterly wronged you, and look them in the face and say, I love you, and I forgive you, and I release you from all the things you've done to me. You say, man, that's hard. Tell me about it. I know it's hard. I've had to do it. Because of the fact that I don't want bitterness to hinder my ability to come into the presence of God and worship Him. I want the, I want the wounds to heal. So don't look back at old conflicts that make you bitter. And here's the last one. Don't look back at old victories that may cause you to think you've already arrived. We do that sometimes. Oh, I remember when we did this, this, and this. Well, that's wonderful. What are you doing right now? We all have victories in our past. There's places where we've been successful, but we're not living in the past. The past is gone. So I can't feed all, you know, when God fed them the manna, they had to pick up the manna that day and eat it because it would not carry over to the next day. It was a great victory that they experienced in God's provision in their life, but it had to take place every day. And so I can't live on the victories of the past. I have to live in the victories of the present. And so don't look back at old victories that may cause you to think you're right. What ride? Why? Because, no, first of all, it will cause you to refu refuse personal sanctification. God wants to sanctify you right now. Don't, don't tell me, well, I used to do this, that, and the other. Oh, I used to walk with God. I used to serve the Lord. You realize how many people I have visited in their homes, whether it's door-to-door -door soul winning or whatever, that have said to me, well, I used to do this, that, and the other. And they, you know what they're saying? I used to be sanctified. Your sanctification from the past does nothing for you in the present. Amen. So it will cause you to refuse personal sanctification. It will motivate you, this matter of not remembering the victories that cause you to think you've arrived, It'll motivate you to remain committed to personal maturation, maturity. 
I am not going to be excited about growing in my faith if all I do is live in the past and say, well, you know what? God provided for me when I was in Bible college. Well, that's wonderful. I graduated from Bible college in 1984. That's a long time ago. <laughs> God's provision back there was wonderful. I can testify of it, but it does nothing for me right now. And so I need victory right now. I want to mature in my walk with God. Personally, I want to know him in a greater way so that I might be able to experience victory upon victory. And then it will enable you to remember our goal is personal emulation. In other words, we're supposed to be like Jesus Christ. For whom the Lord did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. All the time people say, well, you know, well, we're supposed to emulate other believers. You're absolutely right. There are people that are, Paul says, have an example for you. He told Timothy to be an example to the believers. Yes, we're supposed to be following the example of others, but you understand the ultimate goal is to be like Christ. Amen. And if all I do is live in the past in reference to past victories that I've had, I'm going to think I've already arrived. I don't need anything changed in my life. I've had people say that. Oh, I've been saved a long time. I already know all about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, but you're not doing anything to grow in your relationship with Christ. You're not becoming more and more like Christ. Right. Listen, we will have to spend all eternity. The only thing that would help us in being perfectly in line with the reality of who Christ is is that he does a miraculous work in us because we shall be like him, Amen. for we shall see him as Amen. he is. That's a miracle and a work of God. That's nothing to do with us. Hey, all of your life you live here, and then you get in the presence of God. God's got to do Amen. something miraculous Amen. to put you into like his likeness. So why in the world would I build a false confidence that I'm doing okay down here? I'm doing lousy. I'm doing lousy. Because as I look at Christ, and I look at all that he is, and I'm like, man, I've got a long ways to go. That's right. And one of the things that hinders me from desiring to be like Christ more and more each day is looking back. I remember when. That's a dangerous state. I remember when. No, we need to say, God, what will you do now? What needs to change now? Because I don't want to be looking back. Why? Because we look back, Jesus said, no man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Right. And so don't look back. We're getting ready to go into a new year. Uh, all kinds of problems happen in our lives in 2020. You know what? All kinds of things are going to happen in 2021. But we're looking forward. We're looking forward to what it is that God is going to do in our lives. We put our hands to the plow. We're believers in Christ. We're the children of God. Amen. Uh, he has uh, called us for his glory. And he's going to bless us and he's going to use us in a great way. So put your hands to the plow and determine in 2021 you're not looking back. You're going to keep looking to the future of what your life is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together. Uh, Lord, we rejoice in the good Bible studies that we've been able to do tonight in the discussion panel and through the preaching here in the 6 o'clock service. And we're thankful for the grace of God. Uh, that's unbelievable uh, how you work in spite of who we are. And so, Lord, help us not to be contemplating uh, turning and going the wrong direction and help us not to be disillusioned with life and take our hands off of the plow but help us Lord to continue to be depending on the Lord trusting the Lord loving the Lord worshiping the Lord surrendering to the Lord that help us Lord to just keep the hand our hands on the plow now we can keep moving forward uh, following the leadership of Jesus in our life Bless, I pray, in this invitation. If there's someone who's not saved, I pray they would come and believe on Christ tonight and be gloriously saved. Help those of us that are saved and born again 
There may have been something, Lord, that's already starting to hound us and trying to turn us away from what God wants us to do and be. Help us, Lord, to repent of that and turn our life anew and afresh over to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing just two verses of Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. And let's sing it out as our prayer tonight. If you need to pray, you're welcome to come to the altar. Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Thank you for what we've heard tonight. Help us to live it in our lives. Bless us now as we're dismissed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.